I want to continue this evening examining and exposing the new Bible of the Antichrist that has just been published under the title The Revised Standard Version Common Bible with the Apocrypha and General Canonical Books. And then in its title page an ecumenical edition. Could I say to you that any attack upon the word of God originates in hell. Sin, the old serpent, the devil, is the originator of every attack on the word of God. And the people keep company with the devil if they associate themselves with the devil, if they are found in the company of the devil, then they shall be found attacking the word of God. You say that's pretty strong, preacher. It'll be stronger as we go on. But I want to prove that. First of all, everything I say, I'll back with the Word of God. If I don't, you need to bother. But if it's the Word of God, you need to pay heed to. Turn to the portion that we read. Genesis chapter 3. And in Genesis chapter 3, we have the devil coming on the sea. He arrives. And notice his first recorded words. What are they? The sneer. Yea, ha, God said. Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Ye have God said. Don't you hear the serpent's hiss in that statement? Don't you hear the satanic sneer in that statement? Don't you hear the evil attack in that statement? against the divine philosophy, the absolute authority, and the immaculate purity of God's spoken word. What did Eve do? Did she repudiate the devil? Did she rebuke him? No, she held conversation with him. She associated herself with him. She kept company with them. And when you keep company with the devil, the devil's attack upon the world rubs off on you. And you find the first recorded words of the woman now. The woman speaks. And when she speaks, she makes a threefold attack on the Word of God, threefold attack. And I say to you tonight that every attack that's made on the Word of God is a threefold attack. And we can see this in this Bible of the Antichrist. Now have a look at it. First of all, she omits something. There's the attack of omission. You see, she says, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. 
But if you go back with me uh, to verse 16, that's not what God said. She left out something. She left out the word every. And she left out the word freely. For what did God say? Verse 15, verse 16 of the second chapter, He said of every tree of the garden, Thou mayest freely So the first attack on the Word of God is to leave out part of what God said. And this book, this common Bible, is a mutilation mutilation of the text of Scripture. All through it, you have text left out. You come to one verse, it's number 23, verse 23. And you discover the next verse is 25. And then you have a footnote to tell you that that verse is not in the manuscripts that these translators believe in. So they've taken it out of the Bible and put it in a footnote. So this Bible omits part of the Word of God. Omission! That's the first sin. That's the first time. Then there is alteration. Alteration. God said, Thou shalt surely die. That's what God said. He said, Lest ye die. Notice the weakening of God's judgment. Notice the weakening of God's judgment in this. You compare what she said in verse 3 of chapter 3 with what God said in verse 17 of chapter 2. Thou shalt surely die. And so the second attack on the scripture is to alter its meaning. To water down its truth. To adulterate its message. The second attack. And the third attack is the attack of addition, adding to the Word of God. So she added to it. Look at it again. Verse 3. She said, God said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it. God said nothing of the kind. God never said anything about touching it. You go back to verse 17 of the second chapter, and he just said, Thou shalt not eat of it. But he added to the word. He said, Thou shalt not touch it. So there are a, there's a threefold attack. There's an attack of adding to, taking from, and altering the word of God. And I tell you tonight, we have this threefold attack on the Word of God in this book. And immediately he said that. What did the devil say? Look at it. The devil then came in with a direct contradiction of the Word of God. He says, Ye shall not surely die. God said, Thou shalt surely die. The devil said, Thou shalt not surely die. And I tell you how this book came to be corrupted. And how this came about. The devil sneered at God's word and the modernists took up the sneer. And then they decided to take from add to and alter. And now we find the devil's mouth. And he says now I have the whole world church believing that God didn't say the things he said. I have the book. Now a jumble of contradictions. I have succeeded in undermining the word of God. Could I just tell you something? That the Lord Jesus Christ, as a result of He succumbing to the temptation and undermining the scripture, man fell. But you go to the fourth chapter of Matthew's Gospel. And there you have the temptation of Christ turned to me. And my Lord Jesus Christ 
is meeting the same tempter as Eve mapped in the garden, but he meets them at the tempter in a wilderness. Because sin meets you in a garden and makes the garden a wilderness. The result of sin is a wilderness. But what happened? The Lord Jesus Christ mapped the devil. Look at verse 4. What did he say? He said, It is written. Verse 7. It is written again. Verse 10. It is written. And the Lord Jesus Christ mapped the threefold underlining of the Word of God by Eve with a threefold underpinning of the Word of God. My Savior said, and before Jesus Christ left this earth, he prayed a great prayer. Turn to John 17, the 17th chapter of John's Gospel. And in this prayer, three times he says about the Word, about the Word. There's it, but I have given unto them thy words which thou hast given me. Verse 14, I have given them thy word. Verse 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So the Lord Jesus Christ establishes Verifies, confirms, and affirms the Word of God. You know why? Because the incarnate Word is closely linked to the inspired Word. And every attack that's made on the incarnate Word, Christ, is an attack upon the written Word, the inspired Word. And every attack that is made upon the inspired Word is an attack upon the incarnate Word. Now, let us come to this new point. And when I take the preliminary advertisements for this Bible, I read here on this page that the Revised Standard Version Common Bible will be published by Collins during the week of prayer for Christian unity. So it is to be published officially in the week of prayer for Christian unity. Who started this week of prayer for Christian unity? Where did it come from? This week of prayer for Christian unity was commenced in 1908 by two high Anglican clergymen who a year after joined the Roman Catholic Church. And the purpose of this week of prayer, and I quote, recognition by all Christians of the chair of Peter as the divinely constituted center of unity. Isn't that plain enough? That this week of prayer had for its objective a recognition and submission to the Pope of Rome as the center of all Christian unity. And then a Roman Catholic priest by the name of the E. of Paul Couture he discovered that Protestants didn't like praying for that. So he said, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll forget about our objectives. And we will have a short-term objective to get everybody to pray. And when we get them praying, we will then draw up the program. We will set the pace. And before they know, they'll all be praying for unity with rule. And so it happened that the Protestant churches and the World Council of Churches and the Roman Catholic churches on the 18th of this month will all be joining in this week of prayer for unity. And I have the letter. I have it right from the news bag. Presbyterian Church in Ireland. Telephone number. I can give you their telephone number too. 3 Thursday at 4. Church House Belfast. 20th of December. Signed by the Reverend I.S. McDowell 
I'm the Reverend R. M. Freud, conveners of the Interchurch Relations Board. Dear colleagues, they're not addressing me. In close, please find leaflets published in connection with two special weeks of prayer in January. The General Assembly in June resolved that ministers and congregations be encouraged, be encouraged, read it, mark it, learn it, inwardly digest it. You Irish Presbyterians that are here, wake it up and listen. Your church officially said we shall encourage our people to take part in this week of prayer for unity. What is it? Is its objective? Its objective is unity with all. You're to be encouraged to take part in it. Particularly during the week of prayer for Christian unity and or or. The special time of prayer sponsored by the Evangelical Alliance. I want you to notice they put the main week of prayer first and the academic of the Evangelical Alliance week after. Although the Evangelical Alliance week of prayer comes first in time. It asks all ministers and congregations to take part as so encouraged during the seventh, the week, the seventh to the fourteenth, or the eighteenth to the twenty-fifth, nineteen hundred and seventy-three. Yours sincerely. So on. Next Sunday, you go to an ecumenical church taking part in the week of prayer. You will be presented if you're an Irish Presbyterian with this pink paper. You've heard of green papers and white papers. Here is a pink paper. This is the program for unity. Prayer for unity, 1973. Lord, teach us to pray. Material for use during a week of prayer for Christian unity, the 18th to the 25th of January and throughout the year. So we start in praying for unity with a pope. You see that drawing in front of them. Everybody have a seat. That's very important. That Drawing was drawn by who? To encourage you Irish Presbyterians and Irish Methodists and Irish Episcopalians. They're in the world conscious. The cover design is by the Benedictine nuns. Wasn't it very nice of them? That they should spend time to help their separated brethren to take part in this unity with the Pope Clement. Of course, I would have you to know that there's no such thing as a Roman friend in the Irish Presbyterian Church. I'd have you to know that. There's no such thing as any tram. I tell you, friend, that's not a tram today, it's a trot. They're not going in a donkey cart to Rome, they're going in the fastest jet they can hire. Yes, sir. And who grew up this program? This program was drawn up by the British Council of Churches. And who, if you please, was one of the representatives this year to the British Council of Churches from the Irish Presbyterian Church? No less a person than the Reverend Donald Dewey. I want to say something from this pulpit, and I have said it all during my ministry, if you exhort people to break the commandments of God, I had controversy with Mr. Gilly some years ago. And he got on the BBC and he said, The Bible doesn't tell you to separate. The Bible tells you to stay in. I defy anybody to show me in the Word of God where you have to stay in. The Bible says, From such withdraw thyself. What does that mean? That means stay in. The Bible says, Come out. Come among them and be a separate. Does that say stay? The Bible says, come out of her, my people. The Bible says more. The Bible says you're not to bid them time of day or bring them into your house or you'll be partaker of their evil deeds. Read the epistles of John. Mr. Gillies is caught up in the compromise. And he has part responsibility for the actions of a council of which he is officially a member. 
but of course to solve the conscience of the evangelicals. They have inside the pink paper a green paper. A green paper. And this green paper is the 1973 Worldwide Week of Prayer. The theme of this paper is the joy of a Christian. The joy of a Christian. Imagine breaking the word of God and then expecting you to be joined. This is the program of the world's evangelical alliance, emphasis of the jelly. They're afraid to take a stand for God. And I want to tell you that's done just to solve a few consciences and to keep a few compromisers happy and to say, oh, we of our evangelical, we can pray. But whether you're an evangelical or an ecumenist, you're praying and supporting union with Rome, whether you like it or not. You say, Mr. Paisley, that's pretty rough, isn't it? It is. I want to tell you something more. The Irish Presbyterian leaders know that you folks of this generation and of a generation a lot older than I am. For I'd have you to know I'm not too old yet. Let me tell you, they know that we were brought up in orange juice and that we know a wee bit about Protestants and we're not going to be converted, thank God, to any unity move with Rome. And so they're forgetting about you. They're working on their children. Their hope is the younger generation. You know what Eugene Carson Blake said in America the other day? He said, the World Council of Churches would have been a greater success, but for two men, Carl McIntyre and Ian Paisley. That was the greatest compliment ever paid to me. I'm very glad it hasn't been a success. And I want to tell you, by my way, it will not be a success. For I am tempted to hammer this thing as it's never been hammered before. But let me tell you, they know, sir, you with the gray hand, you with very little hair at all, you're not going to be converted. No, sir. You were brought up in the shorter catechism. You know better. And you have seen the past. You lived through the twenties. And you're living through this era. And you know what puppery is. Yes, sir, you know. But there's not much hope of you, little converted. And there's not much hope of my generation as long as the free Presbyterian churches are around preaching of being converted. So they're going to work on the tiny talks, on the children. And so I have in my hand the Presbyterian hurdle. Have a good look at it, you Irish Presbyterian. Come and see it after the service if you don't believe me. Their own magazine. And in the middle of the magazine, they've got a new game. A new game. Don't play snakes and ladders anymore. Little. No, sir. They've got a new game. We want to brainwash the children for unity with Rome. That's it. What is this? It's the Christian life. Adventure here. Christian life. It's the pilgrim's progress. It's how you start being a Christian. And how you go on being a Christian. And your highest attainment as a Christian. So you take your dice and you rattle it. And you throw a six to get started. That's very appropriate for six of the number of man. And I would suggest they should throw three sixes. The number of the Antichrist before the start that would be more appropriate. And you know how you start. Start here. Was baptized. The way you started the Christian. That, my friend, is just black poker. Let me repeat it. That's the start where the church of Rome is at. When the priest baptizes you, you are cleansed from original sin. You are regenerated. You are born again with baptism. And here we have the 
the Irish Presbyterian children and the crew of the other denominations as well that are in the ecumenical movement, they're being taught that you're seeing at baptism. And then you go on. But what's the talk when you get home? 21, when you get to 21, shared in my first Protestant Catholic conference. Man, you're on the way now. I'm telling you, the express train is in the outskirts of Rome now. You're coming into the Vatican State in a full belt. And the final, the final square leaves you ready for anything with Christ. An ecumenical work camp. Joining together with Rome in advancing the kingdom of God among them. Right. You're an Irish Presbyterian, no doubt that's in your home. No doubt your children will start playing the game. And no doubt from earliest age the poison will be put in. Poison will be put in. So it is in this ecumenical week of prayer that as the political apostates have taken us into the common market. The religious apostates have produced a common Bible. Common Bible. And when I open up this Bible, the first thing I read on its cover are these words. For the first time since the Reformation, one complete Bible so you Protestants didn't have a complete Bible, we would have you to know. You Protestants only had a mutilated Bible. But the Pope, and the nuns, and the friars, and the monks, and the cardinals, and the monsignors, and the canons, and the P.P.'s, parish priests, and the C.C.'s, Catholic curates, and all the rest of them got on the job with the World Council of Churches, dignity. They all joined in Presbyterians, Methodists, Church of Ireland, Baptists, United Congregationalists and Presbyterians, Church of Christ, Salvation Army, Church Army, Unitarians, the whole lot of them. And they all got together and they've got you a complete Bible. And I'll tell you something more. This is a wonderful book because it says this book has been blessed. Yes, it's been blessed. It has the blessing of the Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox churches. I want to tell you it's a lie. Because if you were a Protestant and belonged to a Protestant church, you wouldn't bless that publicly. These churches are not Protestant. They're ecumenical. They've gone astray from the standard. Let me tell you something about my Bible. My old Bible blesses me. I don't bless the Bible. I have no blessing to impart to that book, but thank God that book has countless blessings to impart to me. The church didn't give us a Bible. That's what Rome teaches. The Bible gave us the church. What came first? The church and the Bible. The Bible came first. The Word of God. But no sinner see it without the Word of God. No church organized without the Word of God. It's the preaching of the cross that saves them that believe. And man, you know, the great list of men lifting up their hands and blessing. The head of the list is Eugene Carson Blake, General Secretary of the World Council of Churches. He thinks Carl McIntyre and Ian Paisley have fingered the World Council of Churches. Hallelujah. John Cardinal Willie Brown. A good name to advertise Willie Woodbine cigarettes. And President of the Secretariat for Christian Union. Cardinal Koenig. Archbishop of Diana. President of the World Catholic Federation. I love the names that the Roman Catholic Church has. It's a great name. The doctrine of transubstantiation. Man, that would make you tremble, wouldn't it? And the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception. 
and the doctrine of extreme unction. Listen to this fellow. He is the president of the World Catholic Federation of the Biblical Apostolate. Archbishop Athenagoras II of Thyatira in Great Britain. Michael Ramsey, the wolf and the lamb skin. Archbishop of Canterbury. Cardinal Heenan. No show without the Pope. Archbishop of Westminster. The Right Reverend R. Selby Wright, moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland. The Reverend David Russell, General Secretary of the Baptist Union of Great Britain and Ireland. You know what he says? He says the Bible belongs to no one branch of the Christian Church. He thinks that the Church of Rome is just a branch of the Christian Church. It is our common. Heritage! The, the Revised Standard Version Common Bible will make that fact more real than before and strengthen us in common witness. We'll all join together and witness together. We'll have the Pope on one side and the Baptist Union on the other side and the Methodists and the Presbyterians all together. Liquor is all sorts and dollies mixed in. Marcus Long, Archbishop of Sydney, Bishop Butler, Bishop Kenneth Sandbury, General Secretary of the British Council of Churches. I didn't read you anymore, need I? These men have all blessed this book. It's got a blessing. A lot of good it will do. And then they've done something else. They realize that this is a money-making job. And so they've done something that never was done before. Until these new versions came out, they have copyrighted it. So that every time one that Bible is bought, and I regret I had to buy it, so much of the price goes to the World Council of Churches branch in America, the National Council of the Churches of Christ, which were responsible for its publication. If you buy an authorized version of the Scripture, the copyright of the authorized version is reserved to the crown. It's what is known as crown copyright. Nobody gets any advantage from the copyright of the authorized version of the scripture. But when you buy this book, I'm telling you they're making merchandise of the word of God. They have decided we'll make money on it, as we said. And that's part of the game of the ecumenical book. Let me make that clear. So, we're going to get at the young people in our churches, but what about these young people who don't go to our churches? What about the free Presbyterians and the fundamentalists in Northern Ireland, the Brethren, the fundamental Baptist groups and others? What about them? Oh, but we'll get them in the day school. We'll not miss them. And so in some of the day schools already, a directive has got out that from next week, this will be the only Bible used in the school, the common Bible. My daughter's going to Bloomfield Collegiate School, and my oldest girl got word that next, from next week, this would be the Bible that will be used in that school for religious education. I want to say something. I've appeared at this matter in the House of Commons. And the law of this land says that you can use any copy of the Scripture. That's the law. And Christian parent, when your child is ordered to get this book, you go to the schoolmaster. Don't go to the teacher. Go to the head. When I go to deal with the police, I never ask for a constable or a sergeant. Not that they're not all decent men. I ask for the chief superintendent or the, the, the chief constable. I can get. Always go to the top. So you go to the headmaster and say, Mr. Headmaster, I'm just telling you something. My child will be bringing an authorized version of the scriptures to school. And if you're not prepared her to sit in the religious instruction class and be taught out of the authorized version, then you will have to make arrangements for a minister of my church or a teacher from my church to come in and teach her her religion. Because under the act, this is the law of the land. And I have to fight this through Westminster. You know what it says? It says that any leader 
duly appointed by his church, has the right to enter the school and teach his own people the religion that they believe in. So if they want it that way, if the education authorities in Northern Ireland want it that way, I see a great invasion of free Presbyterians going into the school to teach the authorized version. You know what happens down in Armagh? And Mr. Cook goes to the school every week, and his is the biggest class of the lot. They're fighting to get into the free Presbyterian class, just like up in the prison. But I go to preach in the prison, there's nobody at the Presbyterian or Methodist service or the Church of Ireland. They're all at my service. The boys say, you better go to Paisley's service, you hear something there. So the children will hear something. And if you have any trouble, you refer that schoolmaster to me. Just refer him to me and I'll deal with him. For I want to tell you that we're going to fight this thing. And my wife happens to be a member of the Education Committee and of Belfast, and she's going to draft a resolution which will be debated in the Education Committee that our children will be entitled to take the Word of God, the authorized version, the Protestant Bible, the true Bible, the only Bible. They'll be taught out of it in the schools, and if they're not taught out of it, arrangements will be made for them to be taught outside the classroom. And I trust and I pray that every evangelical and every Christian father and mother will do the same thing. You're not getting any encouragement from the evangelicals of this town, emphasis on the jelly. They'll not take much of a stand, but you as an ordinary individual can take a stand by the grace of God. And I'm going to write the religious instructor in my daughter's school a lovely letter this week that will help him. I'm telling you on his way for bringing the common Bible. I write him a nice juicy letter. It will certainly encourage him when he reads it. We've got to take a stand for God. God help us to stand. You're going to allow your child to be taught poison in the day school when you have separated to stand for God as a separatist and a fundamentalist. But of course when your child lifts this Bible, They'll discover that they never had a Bible like this in their hand before because they have been taught the books of the Old and New Testament. But when they come to the end of the Old Testament, they will find that Matthew doesn't then begin. But there's a new section called the Apocrypha, Deuterocanonical books. I'm not worried about that big word, Deuterocanonical. That just means second canon. And then you discover in these books the book of Tobit. Ever hear him? Oh yes, these are wonderful books that we have. And then the book of Judith. So boys and girls, we will read this morning from the sixth chapter of the book of Judith. And then the additions to the book of Esther. I think I told you they add it to the word of God. So they add to the book of Esther. And so on. Book of wisdom. There's no wisdom in it. The book of Sarah, first and second Maccabees, first and second Esdras. And then when you come to this last bit, there's another blank page. And it says here, the following books of the Apocrypha are not regarded as authoritative by the Roman Catholic Church, and therefore are not included among the general canonical books. So Rome warns her children. She gets the warning in. These three books are not part of the Roman Catholic Bible. But when you turn to the beginning of the Apocrypha, it doesn't say here that the Protestant churches have always traditionally rejected these books. Don't you see the subtlety of this publication? Don't you see the idea is to get the Protestants to accept a Roman Catholic Bible? You say to me, preacher, well, how do I know that those weren't parts? of the Old Testament? It's a very good question. You open your Bible and turn to the Gospel of Luke. The Gospel of Luke. Verse 44. And the Lord Jesus, this is a very important scripture. A man came to me after the service this morning. He said, Mr. Pierce, he went too fast this morning. I didn't get that scripture marked. Well, I'll, I'll read it carefully tonight. You get it, Mark. Turn to the last chapter of Luke's Gospel. Why do I reject the Apocrypha? Why do I only believe 
in the Old Testament as it's printed in the Protestant Bible. Well, I'll tell you why. You go into the synagogue of Belfast and say to the man in the synagogue, Sir, could you tell me how many books is in your Bible, the Old Testament Bible of the Jews? And he will say to you, There are twenty-two. And these twenty-two books are as follows. The book of Moses, which is five books, reckoned by them to the five books. It is five books. The book of Joshua, the book of Judges, including Ruth, Reckon to be one book, first and second Samuel, reckon to be one book, first and second Kings, reckon to be one book, first and second Chronicles, reckon to be one book, Ezra and Nehemiah, reckon to be one book, Esther, reckon to be one book, Job, reckon to be one book, Psalms, one, Proverbs, one, Ecclesiastes, one, Song of Solomon, one, Isaiah, one, Jeremiah, Lamentations, one, Ezekiel, one, Daniel, one, and the twelve prophets, reckon to be one, and if you add those up, they're twenty-two. That's how the Jewish church and the synagogue always held to the Old Testament. And that was the Old Testament of our Lord's day. Twenty-two books containing the books you now have in your Old Testament. But it was divided into three. And here we have it, verse 44 of Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. And he said unto them, the Lord Jesus Christ is the speaker. These are the words which I speak unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were it marked in the law of Moses. That's the first section of the Jewish Bible. In the prophets, the second section. In the Psalm, in the apocryphal, the general canonical. Don't read that in there, do you? You just read the threefold division. And those are the books that you have in your Old Testament. And those are the books Jesus Christ put his imprimatur on when he was upon there in this earth. And no more! And then we have the New Testament books, the writing of the apostles of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so Rome has added to the Word of God. I wish I had time to show you the nonsense of the Apocrypha. I must come back to the subject. I'll read you some of the stupidity out of that book, and when you read it, you will laugh. And then they say it's the Word of God. It's puerile nonsense, filled with mistakes, geographical errors, factual errors are all spread through it. But what has it done? What has it put in the Bible for? To lure the Word of God, to put it down, to show the Word of God not to be the Word of God, but the Word of man. Well, I told you this morning that this book has a subtle attack on Jesus Christ, and with this I must finish. Do you know, and this is a very strong statement, that every verse in the Old Testament that is quoted in the New Testament. Do you know that that Bible purposely and deliberately perverts every Old Testament passage? And when you turn to the New Testament, you find that the New Testament has no significance from the Old Testament Scriptures. We believe that Jesus Christ fulfilled the Old Testament. This Bible teaches that Jesus Christ fulfilled nothing of the Old Testament. It's a very serious accusation. But let me prove it to you in one simple text. And I could go on tonight and show you text after text. Turn in your authorized version to Isaiah 7. Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. And Isaiah 7 and 14 is the great verse concerning the virgin birth. Isaiah 7 and 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, a virgin. The word Alma. Every time it occurs in that Bible, the Old Testament, 
It means a virgin. Well, it was printed by the Septuagint translators when they translated it. And they knew Hebrew better than anybody today. They had a better knowledge it, for they were nearer to the time when it was spoken. They translated it as virgin with the Greek word parthenos, which means virgin. But here's what the new Bible says. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And when that particular verse was printed in this Revised Standard Version, an infidel Jew, Balfour Pickman of Temple Sinai, Washington, this is what he wrote. I am delighted to know that at last this great error of translation has been finally corrected and that at least some elements of the Christian world no longer officially maintain that Isaiah 7.14 is a prediction that Jesus was to be born of the Virgin Mary. Now, when I turn over in the New Bible, in the common Bible. When I turn over and you turn over in your Bible to Matthew 1, Matthew chapter 1. And in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And you say, well, I must look at that text in the Old Testament. And when I turn back in the Old Text Testament, I find that the Old Testament said no such thing according to this Bible. It said a young woman would conceive of an embarrassment. And so the New Testament is made to contradict the Old. And if you have before you a piece of paper, let me give you some scriptures. I can't deal with them, but note them down now. And these scriptures in this Bible contradict one another. Psalm 45, 6. Compare with Hebrews 1, 8. Psalm 45, 6. Compare with Hebrews 1, 8. Hebrews 1, 8 says of Christ, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Testimony to the deity of Christ. When I turn back in the Bible, the common Bible, I find that in Psalm 45 and 6, it changes it to your divine throne, tearing away the deity of Christ and making the Bible to contradict itself. Micah 5, 22, compare with Matthew 2, 5 and 6. In that passage it says in your authorized version that Christ was from of old. His goings are of old, but everlasting. That means he's eternal. Do you know what this common Bible says? It says his origin was of ancient days. What does that mean? That there was a point in time when Jesus began. He's not eternal. Again, the contradiction. Psalm 118, 26, Matthew 21. Nine and ten. And here is an attack on the hymn that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hymn that cometh in the name of the Lord. That word cometh is removed from the Old Testament scripture and it's made to change to enter. Enter. That is a testimony to the first coming of Christ. Not the entering of Christ, but the coming of Christ. It's very important. Because Jesus Christ came, and he's coming a second time. Of course, this Bible attacks the second coming of Christ. Here's another two scriptures. Psalm 110, verse 1, Matthew 22 and 44. The Lord said unto my Lord. You know that portion of scripture. The Lord said unto my Lord. Sit you on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. And in our Bible you will notice 
It is the Lord, spoke with a capital L, said unto my Lord, spelled with a, spelled with a capital L. But in this Bible it's T. My Lord, spelled with a capital L, the, the Lord, spelled with a capital L, said unto my Lord, Lord, spelled with a small L. Again, an attack on the deity of Jesus Christ. That he's not equal to the Lord. That Jesus Christ is not co-equal with the Father. And then Hebrews 1, 5 and Psalm 2, 7. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry. I have set my Son upon my holy head of God. Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. And that's changed to a Son. Son spelt with a small s in the Old Testament. But when I read it in the New Testament, I discover it's translated properly. So I find that the Old Testament contradicts the New. That's the master mind of the devil. The devil says, I'll produce a book which will show that the New Testament is a contradiction of the Old. But Jesus Christ did not fulfill any prophecies. For if you look at the Old Testament prophecies in this book, you will find that they're different entirely to the fulfillment of them in the New Testament. And God has put, and the devil has put it into their mind to obey the beast and to give their learning and their kingdom to him. And that is exactly what has taken place in that book. I'm preparing a thorough booklet on this subject and it will be published and I will be dealing with these matters fully. But I say tonight in this meeting to you, this is the most serious attack that has ever been made in the scriptures of truth. It's a serious attack because it's backed by the full machination of the Roman Catholic Church, and it's backed by the full machination of the World Council of Churches. And I have only one thing to say, and I'm going to quit now. There are people in this church tonight, good Christian people, I know them. And I respect them. But alas, they're tied up in this apostasy. They're tied up in this apostasy. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says to you, Come out from about and be ye separate and touch not the unclean thing. Are you going to come out this night? Or are you going to stay in that Methodist church, that church of Ireland, or that Presbyterian church? and remain part and parcel of this ecumenical move. Now is the time to come out. Talking to a dear brother the other day, and he was telling me that up in a certain church not far from me, a Presbyterian church, there was a man that up in the pulpit and he read the New English Bible. And he said there was a brother in that church and he stood to his feet and he stamped out. And there was a medical doctor sitting beside this brother and he said, do you think he's taken ill? And he says, brother, he's got something you couldn't cure. He's sick of the New English Bible. He didn't go back to the church. He stood up. He got out. And he stayed out. And that man that spoke to the doctor, he got out along with him. And they're both in this church here tonight. Amen. Rejoicing in freedom. You would need to get out tonight, my brother. My sister, have I become your enemy for telling you the truth? Have I offended? Understand, there was a man here this morning, a good friend of mine, he's still in the Presbyterian Church, and he was mad. He wouldn't shake hands with me. Went through another door. God bless him. Lay the conviction on him fast and thick. Amen. And I trust that he'll come out and stand for God. It's not an easy path. But I tell you, it's God's path for you. You better do it. You better get out of this ungodly thing, or you will be a partaker of the judgment. I'm going to say something now a bit more strong than that. The Bible says there's a voice from heaven that says, Revelation 18, come out of her my people. The Bible says, My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. If you're a true sheep, 
you will follow the Lord. And if you don't follow the Lord, it's quite possible that you had only a hypocritical profession of faith that you never were born again. Yes, sir. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of God. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. You can't disobey the word of God and say you're doing the will of God. Maybe there's someone here tonight and you're not saved. Let me tell you, friend, the World Council of Churches can do nothing for your soul. You know what the secretary of the World Council of Churches, the first secretary visit to Horf, said? He said the World Council of Churches is a ship. We don't know whether it's seaworthy or not. He says we don't know whether it will hold the crew that's going to get aboard it or the passengers. In fact, he says we don't know what's the front of the ship or the back of the ship. He says we don't know where we're going either. But he says, we have intended and vowed to stay together. And he says, we're launching this ship amidst one of the worst storms in history. Would you get aboard that ship? You wouldn't go aboard that ship to cross the wagon, but alone to sail for eternity. And yet you're aboard it tonight with your family, sir. You're jeopardizing the salvation of your family. A very sad story told to me the other day of a man. And he sat in a congregation. And the congregation made a decision to come out and leave the apostles. And he was in the front seat of the church. And he came up to the preacher afterwards, and this preacher walked out and took his congregation with him, started a fundamental assembly of this church. And he came up to the preacher that morning, and he put his hand in his, you know what he said? He said, preacher, pastor, all that you said was true. But if I didn't stay in the great denomination, I would jeopardize the future of my family. So I'm going to stay in. And that man stayed in. And his family literally went to hell. His oldest son disgraced the family name. His daughter was stricken with a terrible disfiguration of her face and limb. And the man died about nine months later. What a different story would have been told. If he had followed God. I was the preacher in a Christ as in Bally Mummy. And I called the people in that district to separate. And there was a man called Alexander McCauley in my congregation. Alexander McCauley had a fine group of sons. I think he had seven sons and three daughters. He was just starting in the agricultural machinery and lying and working at excavations and cutting down man's crops and dealer work. He was just starting. And his Presbyterian friends came to him and the said, Sandy, if you associate with Peasel, we'll put you out of business. You'll not cut another crop. You'll not do another job in the district. And I was staying in that man's house. And he came up to me one day into the back. And there were tears in his eyes, and he put his big hard hand in mine. I can feel it in my hand yet. And he says, Ian, I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to follow God. And that man came out. And I want to tell you, his sons are the biggest businessmen in that district today. And I want to tell you, God honored the family. And the old Presbyterian minister got drunk, and he went down into that man's farmyard, and he got two other men to hold him, and he bashed his teeth. I want to tell you, God bless that family. Sandy's in heaven. He's gone in to see the king and his people. 
When I went back to see them a year after the great fight we had, in those days the Free Presbyterians had a rough time. I've gone to meetings, my friend, when the people come in and their coats had spittles on them. People spat on them as they went to church. Yeah? Come and they have been beaten by their friends for coming. Yeah. And I want to tell you something. Sam, they took me round this farm. And he said to me, I want to show you what the Lord has done. He said, a year ago I come out and it was to be finished. But he said, I want you to have a look at this corn. I'm six foot two and a half and my stock and soul. I couldn't look over it. He says, you know what they call that in this country? Paisley's corn. <laughs> he said, it never grew as high. He says, Ian, the day I put my hand in your hand and said, I will be God. God has blessed me. Every one of my family is him. And he says, I'm living with the joy of God in my soul. I tell you, it pays to serve God, sir. It pays to serve God. When you come outside the camp of Stanford, some years ago we couldn't have offered you, offered you a good pew or warm toe with a heater under every pew. We can offer you that today. But I just wonder how we the same fire in our souls that we had in those days when we were persecuted for righteousness. God grant that we'll never surrender in this church. God grant that we'll always be on fire for God, preaching the word of God and winning souls for Christ. Dear unsee a person can see. Dear Christian, leave the apostasy. Stand with the people of God. Get into a good Bible separated, fundamentalist gospel preaching, missionary five church. And let's see souls see of the God work prospering. And let's see of our family and our country. From Pumerang and ecumenism and the cancer of the devil's false religions and deception. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy word. We thank thee that it's a good word, it's a gracious word, it's a blessed word. And we pray as we go, go with us. Separate up the sins. Restore the backsliders. Seal the sinners. And help us to stand for God and bless us as we write this book. And make it a sword that will pierce the armor of the devil. For Jesus' sake. And everybody say, Amen. Today is the publication day of the Old Testament of the New English Bible. In 1961, the New Testament of the New English Bible was published. At that time I prepared a little booklet entitled The New English Bible Version or Perversion. And I showed by a comparison of the authorized version and the New English Bible version that the New English Bible was in fact a perversion of God's precious word. I might mention that copies of that booklet, the New English Bible New Testament version or perversion, are still available for those that would like to have them. Now the Old Testament part and the apocryphal writings are now published by the New English Bible translators. I have a copy of the publication here and also the handbook that goes with it. And these have now been released. The translators of the New English Bible tell us that the authorized version cannot now be understood. 
Its language is archaic. It's become more, it is becoming more and more a volume that cannot be understood by the people. Hence the need for a Bible in the language of the present day. I would like to say that I do not agree that the Bible in its language is a misunderstood book. I believe that the authorized version today is still the best version of Holy Scripture. But I would say that no one would want to quarrel with a production of a version of the Bible in the language of modern England, provided that version was a true translation and faithful to the original scriptures. The final acceptance, of course, of such a version would be a matter for the English-speaking people. Our certain hard facts, however, show that this so-called translation of the Old Testament is not merely a version in modern English. It is more than that. It is, as its title tells us, the New English Bible. And it is not a version of the Old Bible, but in fact a New Bible, an ecumenical production. Right at the outset, I would like to draw your attention to two scriptures. The first is found in the Old Testament, Psalm 11 and verse 3. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? I want you to mark that scripture and note it carefully. A great question. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And as I go on, I think I can prove to you conclusively that this version is an attack upon the great foundation, the infallible word of the living God, the only infallible rule of faith and practice. But do not be alarmed, my friends. The New English Bible translators are not the first to corrupt the Word of God. If you turn with me over to 2 Corinthians, at the chapter 2 and at the verse 17, you will find that in Paul's day there were those who set their hand to the corruption of the great foundation. First, Second Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 17. For we are not as many. I want you to notice that. Paul said the religious leaders, the majority, the many, the many, corrupt the word of God. And if you look in your margin, you will find that the rendering there is deal deceitfully with the Word of God. So in Paul's day, there were many who dealt deceitfully with the Word of God. But Paul says, we are as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. And so this is an age-long attack in an attempt to corrupt the Scripture. Now in the handbook, the translators tell us that this is an authoritative translation sponsored by the major Christian body. And in the front of the Bible, it tells us that this Bible is planned and directed 
by the following religious denominations. The Baptist Union of Great Britain and Ireland, the Church of England, the Church of Scotland, the Congregational Church in England and Wales, the Council of Churches for Wales, the Irish Council of Churches, and that includes the Presbyterian, Church of Ireland, Methodist, and the Unitarian Church, the non-subscribing Presbyterian Church, the London Yearly Meeting of the Society of Friends, the Methodist Church of Great Britain, the Presbyterian Church of England, the British and Foreign Bible Society, and the National Bible Society of Scotland. Now these movements are all part and parcel of the World Council of Churches. This is an ecumenical Bible sponsored by the churches of the ecumenical movement. And of course you can have no show with a papa. And so they stretched out their hands and they said, Dear Papa, come with us and help us to destroy the Protestant Bible. And the hierarchies of the Roman Catholic Church in England and Scotland accepted their invitation to appoint representatives. So the representatives of the Roman Antichrist, I'm reading from the preface to the New English Bible, the representatives of the Roman Antichrist were there to guide the whole of this translation. So here we have a book that is offered in the name of the World Council of Churches. I want to say something this morning. That the Bible does not derive its authority from the church. The Bible derives its authority from the God of heaven. We come now to basic Protestantism and basic Romanism. Romanism says the Bible's authority is the church. The Protestant reformers said the Bible's authority is the God of heaven who gave it. And this book is offered authoritatively by these so-called Christian bodies. Secondly, I want to mention to you that this Bible claims that it is the best that the best available scholars could produce in the light of the new knowledge that has been discovered. What is new in religion is not true, and what is true in religion is not new. And this expression, new knowledge, is an elastic term and covers a wide field. It is having regard to the declared views of the translators themselves, a knowledge which rejects the Scriptures as the infallible Word of God. Right on the introduction to this book, they command certain men. And one of the men they command is Professor C. H. Dawes. And they say that it is right that his name with others should always be associated with the New English Bible. Dr. Dodd is a notorious apostate. In this book, The Authority of the Bible, he denies every tenant that evangelicals stand for. Let me just give you one little quotation from this book to prove what I am saying. He says it is high time to assert unambiguously that the Bible contains a good deal which if it is taken out of a contemporary historical context and given general and permanent validity is simply pernicious. So the Bible parts of it are pernicious. The old dogmatic view 
of the Bible, therefore, is not only open to attack from the standpoint of science and historical criticism, but if taken seriously, becomes a danger to religion and public morals. So Dr. Dodd says the Bible is pernicious and it is a danger to public morals. He goes on to say that Moses is a man of legends, a medicine man, he calls him, and he goes on to deny that Moses ever had any existence. This whole book is one diabolical attack upon the scriptures of truth. Need I say that we prefer the testimony of the Lord Jesus to Mr. Dodd? Jesus said, Moses wrote of me. And you can put God on one side and the Lord on the other side, and I'll be accepting the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me go further. On the flap of this new Bible, we are informed that the translation is not the expression of of any denominational or doctrinal standpoint. It aims to be in style neither traditional nor modernistic and is offered as a new and authoritative version of the Bible for use in worship, for teaching, or for private meeting. And so they try to tell us that this Bible is not modernistic, and it's not traditional. It is a fearful translation. But when I open up the Bible, I find that no less a person than the Archbishop of York, he tells us that when they have troublesome passages, they had a long discussion and then accepted corporate responsibility for the interpretation set forth in the translation adopted. So this Bible is not a translation. It's an interpretation. And that's what we will find. And Professor Reed, in commenting on how they did their work, he said, that as far as they were concerned, they had to get an interpretation that everyone could agree to. And when they got one that everyone agreed to, then they wrote it into the Bible. So the Bible, this is not the translation, this is an interpretation, as we shall see. So much for those few remarks by way of preface. Let us come to the examination of one great doctrine of the Bible, the virgin birth of Christ. Apostasy in this vital doctrine leads to trouble apostasy in all vital doctrines. To deny the virgin birth is to reduce the Lord Jesus Christ to the level of an ordinary individual, and hence his place in the Godhead is repudiated. He cannot be the Son of God if he's not born of a pure virgin. If Christ is not what his Father declared him to be, and remember twice from heaven, God the Father spoke and he said, This is my beloved Son. Are we to reject the testimony of God the Father and accept the testimony of this bunch of acumenists re in regard to Jesus Christ? Now the first great promise, and if you have your Bible, if you open it with me in Genesis chapter 3, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, often called the first Evangel. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, 
and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heat. Look carefully at that verse, and let me read it to you out of the New English Bible. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your brood and hers. They shall strike at your head, and you shall strike at their heel. Two notable changes. Striking at number one, a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ. This scripture is what we call messianic and prophetic. It is a prophecy concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. In your authorized version, it reads, It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. It is in the singular, it's picking out a particular seat and it's particularizing about a certain individual. That this age long conflict between the woman's seat and the devil's seat will come to a great climax one day and someone would appear, appear on the stage of time and that glorious person would break the devil's head and in the breaking of his head the devil would wound and strike at that person and bruise his head. This is now completely destroyed. In the New English Bible, this verse has nothing whatsoever to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. By changing the singular to a plural, they have destroyed the messianic implication and prophetic truth of this verse. Let us turn to another great verse in the authorized version that deals with the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's found over in the 31st chapter of Jeremiah, and at the verse 22, How long wilt thou go about, O thy backsliding daughter? For the Lord hath created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. Now, this verse of Scripture is clearly prophetic and messianic. Since natural generation commenced with the begetting of Cain, a woman in pregnancy always compassed the child, and often that child was a man-child. Here a new thing is mentioned. The result of a creating act of God, not the result of any act of man. For the Lord hath created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall compass a man. This text, as reference to the passage can verify, stands before prophetic scriptures which tell of the ushering in of the gospel dispensation. Look at verse 15. Verse 15 of that chapter tells us of the wheels that were heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel weeping for her children refused to be comforted because they were not. The new thing done by God in the woman compassing a man is none other than the virgin birth. Notice how the scriptures refer to this not as generation, but as creation, a direct reference to the incarnation. Now let us read how the New English Bible completely destroys and distorts this passage. 
Look at verse 22 in your authorized version of Jeremiah 31, and I'll read it in the New English Version. How long wilt thou twist and turn my wayward child? For the Lord has created a new thing in the earth, a woman turned into a man. A woman turned into a man. Now, this is a clear and deliberate corrupting of the Word of God. The Hebrew root Saban is the root of the verb that's used here. And in the vast majority of cases, various words having the general significance of compass have been used by the New English Bible translators. In other words, in all the other scriptures, where this root verb is used, this word, having its root sabbath to encompass is used, they always use it in its proper meaning. For instance, if you look at with me at Jeremiah 31, the very same chapter, and verse 39, you will find it occurs again. And the measuring line shall yet go forth over against it upon the hill Gareb, and shall compass about to go up. Now that's in the same chapter, that's the same word, that word compass. And in the New English Bible in verse 39, we read, The measuring line shall be laid straight out over the hill Gareb, and run, go up. So in that chapter, when that word occurs again, they are prepared to accept that it means around, or encompassed, or surrounding, or hemmed in, or a similar word. But when it comes to the virgin birth of Christ, so great is their hindrance of a virgin born Savior that they deliberately depart from their own accepted translation. And they twist the scripture and make this verse to read, A woman shall be turned into a man. That scripture, my friend, is enough to condemn the whole English, New English Bible out of hand. But let us come to the great scripture in Isaiah 7 and verse 14. The great scripture. In fact, this was the first scripture I turned to when I got a copy of this Bible. Isaiah 7 and 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. This is a scripture that's clear. It is crystal clear. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now let's turn to the New English Bible, and you keep your eye on that passage in the authorized version. And let me read to you the New English Bible translation of that very important verse. Therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. A young woman is with child, and she will bear a son, and will call him Emmanuel. Now the word Alma, which appears in this verse in the Hebrew, this word occurs in seven other passages of Scripture. Perhaps you'd like to mark them down. Genesis 24, 43. Exodus 2 and 8. Psalm 68, 25. Proverbs 30 and 19. Song of Solomon 1 and verse 3. And 6 and verse 8. And then in Isaiah 7, 14. Now 7 in Scripture is the number of perfection. 
So the Holy Spirit gave us a perfect guide in the Old Testament to the meaning of this word Alma. Professor Machen, in his great scholarly work, The Virgin Birth of Christ, says, As a matter of fact, there is no place among the seven occurrences of Alma in the Old Testament where the word is clearly used of a woman who was not a virgin. In his Prophets and Promise, Professor Willis Beecher says, There is no trace of its use to denote any other than a virgin. And yet the New English Bible changes it completely. In uh, Genesis 24, 43, they translate it young woman. In Exodus 2, 8, they translate it girl. In Psalm 68, 25, they translate it girl. In Proverbs 30, 19, they translate it girl. In Song of Solomon 1, verse 3, they translate it maidens. And in the Song of Solomon 6 and 8, they translate it with young woman. And so this word, this Hebrew word, that incontestably means virgin because of the hatred of these men to the virgin birth of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. They deliberately dis distort the meaning and change it. Why? In order to attack the lovely person of my most wonderful Lord. The virgin birth of Christ is most important. The virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ is essential to the whole Christian revelation. If Christ was not born of a virgin, first of all, he was born out of wedlock. And so they make our Lord by this scripture a bastard child. And of course the modernists have gone so far as to say that. Professor Davy, once the principal of Assemblies College, he said that Jesus Christ was the illegitimate son of Joseph and Mary. Leslie Weatherhead, in his latest book, The Christian Agnostic, says that Jesus Christ was the child of a, an illicit relationship between the father of John the Baptist, Zacharias, and Mary. Niels Ferre says he's a great modernist preacher across the Atlantic Ocean, great acumenist. He says Christ was the bastard child of some German mercenary soldier who lived in a military camp near to where Mary lived. And he says, this is what happens to young women near military camps, and this is what happened to Mary. And so the whole attack is against the virginity of the virgin and the glorious, miraculous virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. This scripture in Isaiah 7 and 14, it's worthy of our consideration. You know, they say... What was the good of this sign if it was given to Ahaz? Because Ahaz didn't live to see it. But if you read the scripture, you will find that this was not given to Ahaz. Look at verse 12. In verse 11, the old prophet said, Ask the sign of the Lord thy God. Ask it either in the depth or in the height above. The earth strictly excluded in the height or in the depth. And old Ahaz says, I'll not ask. And then the Lord said, Hear ye now, O house of David. This promise was not given to Ahaz at all. It was given to the house of David that of David's feet there should come Christ. And the promise is there for the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son. And in the original Hebrew, the word virgin has the definite article 
Behold the virgin. Only one virgin. A particular virgin. A chosen virgin. And a divinely appointed virgin shall bear a son. And shall call his name. Amen. Notice that word, a sign. A sign. Now you turn over with me to Luke's Gospel. And you'll find that that sign appears again. Luke chapter 2. And verse 34. And it says, And Simeon blessed them and said unto Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. And for a sign which shall be spoken against. And today, brethren, this scripture is fulfilled in our ears. The virgin birth, this divine sign is spoken against in this perversion of the Word of God. Now, of course, these quasi-evangelicals will tell us that there are many good things about the new English Bible. If I put a cake before you on the table, and I say to you, this cake has the best flower, it has the best fruit, it is the best possible ingredients, but I have put quite a lot of strychnine into it. Would you eat that cake? You would say it is a poison cake. I will reject it. And my friend, they say there's good things in this Bible. But let me tell you, this is a poison book. And it is the duty of God's people to reject it. This book has rejected your virgin born Savior. And it is your duty to reject this book. The trouble is that this book will become the school boys and school girls' Bible. This week my second child, Rhonda, came home. She said, Daddy, they're starting to read the New English Bible at our assembly. I said, Tomorrow, dear, you go to your teacher and tell her you will not be back in the assembly. And the next day, being a true Paisley, she went to her teacher. She said, Teacher, they are reading the New English Bible. My daddy says I have not to be at assembly. And the teacher said, All right, stay outside while it is being read. And I trust that every parent will do the same. Let us make our protest. And let us see to it that our children are not introduced to a perversion of the Scripture but that our children are brought up upon a virgin that's faithful to the Word of God. People have said to me, why have you on your notice board the authorized version of the Scriptures used? I'll tell you why. The authorized version of the Scriptures is a version that God has set His divine seal upon. This version, born in 1611, out of the conflicts and the trouble of the great Reformation. And the Bible that you're reading today is almost identical with the Reformer's Bible. Around these walls you'll find the bust of William Tyndale, the man who gave us the Scriptures. And Tyndale's version is almost identical with this version that we hold so dear. This Bible has been honored of God. The men who translated this Bible were committed to the fact that the Bible was the Word of God. And because of that, you will find that there are many words printed in your Bible in italic. You know why? Because the Reformers put those words in to make sense. But such was their reverence for the Word of God that they said we must point out that these words are not in the original. We must point out that these words are put in by us in order to bring out the sense in the English language. 
But who are we to dare to add one word to God's holy book? There are no italic printing in this Bible. In fact, they claim here that this is not a verse-to-verse -verse translation. The NEP is not a word-for-word -word translation. And sometimes not a sentence-for-sentence -sentence translation. They have added to the book. They have taken words from the book. They have changed the meaning of words in the book. They have taken away all the headings to the Psalms. You know why? Because these headings help to establish the Davidic authorship of many of the Psalms. They don't like that. They don't believe David wrote any of the Psalms. So they cut out the introduction to the Psalms. Why? And they tell us that Moses, in their introduction, they tell us Moses didn't write. They knew the first five books. Right here in the preface, they say that these books were written from the 12th to the 2nd century B.C. Now, Moses wrote Genesis 1450 odd years before Christ. But they don't believe that. So they say that the scriptures were written from the 12th to the 2nd century. And we all know that none of the scriptures were written in the 2nd century because there was a 400 year break between Malachi and John the Baptist and the canon of the Old Testament was completed in the 5th century before Christ. See how subtly they would change the word of God and condemn the teachings that are found there. What more can I say than use that great word that the authorized version is incomparable in its faithfulness, majestic in its language, inexhaustible in its spiritual fruitfulness. This time-honored version continues to reveal to millions the matchless grace of him whose name is the Word of God, and who is crowned with glory and honor. I'm glad there's a copy of God's Word that the corrupting fingers of man will never touch, that copy that is settled in heaven. And Jesus said, Heaven shall pass away, and earth shall be no more, but my Word shall abide forever, and he that doeth the will of God shall abide forever. May God help us to stand against ecumenism and this false Bible. And tonight we'll see what this Bible says about the death of Christ. We'll see what this Bible says about the deity of Christ. We'll see what this Bible says about the ministry of Christ. And all, everything I have said today or tried to say I have put into a booklet which will be published tomorrow in London and I hope to have copies on Tuesday and so you will have in your hand a national of facts that you'll be able to use against the ecumenists who will be sponsoring this mistranslation of the scriptures of truth. Let's all stand to our feet and sing one verse of the hymn number 149. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And we'll sing the last verse, since I must fight if I would read. Let's all stand to our feet.